Let's take our Bibles uh, this afternoon, turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verse 19. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. Thank you. Say thank you. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. When you find that in your Bible, if you'll stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God, Genesis 2, 19. Genesis 2, 19, if you have it, say amen. Amen. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for being the God of the universe, the God that created everything. Lord, thank you for being the God of our salvation, the God of our deliverance, and the God of our sanctification. Lord, I pray that you would be with with these fellows tonight as they come to preach what you've laid on their heart. Lord, they've studied your word, and they're ready to give us all the truth. Help them, be with them, calm their nerves. In Jesus' name, amen. As a child back in Sunday school, I learned this simple truth that Jesus died to take my sin away. And I can still remember when it changed my life way back then. And the cross is just as real to me today. I still believe in the power of the blood Jesus shed on my I still hold and I still cling to the old rugged cross. Some may say I'm old enough to stand without holding his hand, but with each passing day I need him more. For he's become my everything and that's the reason why I cling to Calvary and all the cross stands for. I still believe in the power of the blood. I still hold and I still cling to the old rugged cross. And I still cling to the power. There is still forgiveness for the lost. I still believe, I still hold and I still cling.
thing. going to split hell wide open. It's Jesus plus nothing. Amen. All right, please uh, please uh, say amen for these guys and encourage them. It's tough to be up here, uh, some for the first time, and uh, they feel like God's given them, they believe God's given them a truth and they want to get it across. I know what that feels like. I know. Okay, but you only got seven minutes, so it's kind of like being a trombone player in a phone booth, okay? It's, it's, they, they haven't got much room. Uh, that's why you guys, I keep telling you every year, I wouldn't pray and I wouldn't read a bunch of scripture because that's cutting into your seven minutes, okay? We, we prayed for you. Do what you do. You're going to do what you're going to do, but we prayed, and if you want to read one scripture, that's fine. I had a guy one year get up here and read 20 20 uh, verses of scripture. He had like 30 seconds to preach. You know? uh, so, but let's encourage them. They're, they're, a, they're a great group of guys. Okay. Uh, Tony. Right. Well, first off, Mr. Shannon Gillis. Give him a welcome. telling preacher, I don't know, I think seven minutes may be about twice as much time as I need, so uh, <laughs> we're going to try to get, get through it here, but the, the passage of scripture that Tony read, that is, it's the beginning of God giving Adam the permission to name all the animals, all the beasts of this earth, and it's the very beginning, and, and there's more in uh, Genesis and more in Exodus where we're given definitions. We're given definitions of the things that, the way that God wants us to behave. Uh, definitions of what a man is, what a woman is, um, good and evil, mothers and fathers, and even soldiers. Definitions that were handed down at the very beginning. And I'm taken back a little bit just by watching what's going on in current events where what we see is everything that we've ever believed. Now, I was raised in church, and a lot of you were, maybe some of you weren't. Um, but everything that I ever believed seems to be coming under attack, where a man is no longer a man the way that I realized it, or the, man, the, man, the way that I learned it. And women and, and good and evil, all of those definitions have been changed, where men can have babies and Women and men can compete in women's sports. Everything is turned upside down. It's turned, it's topsy-turvy. And not really looking to get political, but what we have to do sometimes is go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning where, where we were given these set of rules. And, and always, whenever we go back to the beginning and we're going back to the Bible, that's going to that's gonna give us some clarity. Now, what we, what we find is that these folks that are authoring this confusion, they're blinded in darkness. And darkness is something that's uh, interesting. Sometimes on Saturdays I'll come up here and either cleaning the church or whatever we're doing, happen to be doing, and all the lights will be off here in the auditorium. And sometimes, you know, we'll, I'll sit there and I'll think about some things or maybe I'll pray right before I, I clean the place and uh, given a great truth the last time I was here, and that great truth, you might want to write it down, is that it gets really dark in this auditorium when there's no lights. Um, so, and, and it can be dangerous. Danger, uh, darkness can be dangerous. And I'll give you an example, um, because there's no more greater danger in darkness than when I'm, whenever I'm trying to get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom, because our our bedroom is totally dark, but there's an obstacle course as well, because there is be there's a bed, there's a dresser, but the worst obstacle really is there's two pink bear claw beds on the on the ground next to her side of the bed, and you know if you're not careful you'll step on a dog and the dog will yelp and 
everything will go crazy. And the worst part of it is not the dogs. And it's not stumping your toe, but it's if you wake the bear, there's going to be there's going to be problems. There is going to be problems. And and again, you know, that's what we see. They're changing our definitions right in front of our face. They're at, they're acting as if we haven't already been here. In my case, 52 years. We haven't. We've already been here for 52 years. We've learned what these terms are, and you don't get just just to come back in and change that. Um, and again, hard to see when it's dark, and sometimes it's dangerous. Now, science tells us that we understand, or science understands, everything about this natural world. That if you have a question, go to science, and well, science has the answer. But science, in many cases, uh, science is good, you know, medical, that sort of thing, it's, it's great. But in many cases, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of faith. And science will try to define you. It will try to define you as a man, as a woman, as a person. Uh, it will try to define our movement as a church, as Christianity. Well, we have, to, we have to strive to not be defined by science or by the outside world. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. So when you have a lot of people that have questions, it can it can be obvious that that lot of those people do not understand the belief. They never really understand who God is.
prayer? So apart from producing a desired or intended result, being effective, fervent, having or displaying a passionate intensity, doing it something with passion, giving it your all, giving it your all, fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit, Amen. being sincere, being enthusiastic. For those of you who don't speak English, con ganas. <laughs> okay? You can only be righteous, though, through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. You have no righteousness of your own. Righteousness comes from God. Do you want, seriously want your prayers answered? Then you really have to become righteous. Okay? Shall not he render to every man according to his works? What are your works? Are your works righteous? What is righteousness? It is the state of being morally correct, justifiable being in rightness, acting in accordance with the divine or moral law. Being free from guilt or sin. That puts me out. We sin because of the things we think. We verbalize. Things like that. Being righteous means to be right, especially in a moral way. Being obedient. Obedient to what? The Bible, to God's law. Obeying all of his commandments. Some of them were simple. Preacher went over them, a lot of them this morning. Attending church. Using your talents for the Lord. Not only coming to the church services, but coming to church functions. Like basketball. Also, serving in some capacity in the church. Driving, singing, teaching, Nursery work, cleaning, the church, filling in where you see a need, doing things that need to get done that nobody else is doing that you saw it doing. You know, oh, I see that piece of paper, the bottle on the ground. You just leave it there, walk away. Somebody's going to have to pick it up. Why not you? Okay? Filling in wherever there's a need. Okay? And saving money for the church. I can't tell you how many times I got in the men's room and somebody left the water running full blast. Yeah. Or you go upstairs after Sunday school and the fans and the lights are all on up there. Now, it used to be I could do that. I was taller. I've lost two inches since I started coming to this church. <laughs> I, I can't reach the little strings anymore to turn off the fans. I need somebody to help do that. Okay? But it saves the church money. Okay? So that's one thing. Then, in love. The Bible says men love your wives. You say, but she's ugly, she's fat, she's old, <laughs> she's rebellious. But you know what? Adam, Adam is the only one who can say, Lord, the woman that thou gavest me, the rest of you chose her like Samson. You said, she pleases me well. Get her for me. You're in trouble now. It's like preacher said, you're the one that asked to get saved. Now you have to live as a Christian. You're the one that asked for that woman. She's yours. Love her. He didn't put any conditions on it. He said, love your wives. Amen. And then wives, you're supposed to love your husbands too. Okay? In Titus, oh, there's another verse. Two, three, and four. <laughs> At the age, I'm sorry, that the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as according to holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teaching of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. How are you going to teach somebody to do something you don't know how to do yourself? Okay? You need to love your husband. So the Bible does clearly state women are to love their husbands. You say, well, he's ugly, he's a strange, he's a fighter, he's mean, he's bad. Somebody told me I was bad this morning. <laughs> when, when my wife, it was some other woman. <laughs> okay? 
He doesn't say he just to love her because she's hot. He says love her. Okay? He said, by this, you, they shall know that you are my disciples. He said that you love one another. If you have love one for another, this is in John 13, 34. He said, if you love your neighbor, Mark 13, 24. If you love your enemy, well, my husband certainly is that. Oh, no. John 6, 27. God clearly commands women to love their husbands. And the last thing you need to be obedient in is obeying the preacher. Be sure you say, well, he's only a man. He's just a man like me, so what? You know what? He's God's man. Amen. That's the difference. Obey him. This morning he preached, and he mentioned a few things. If you need a haircut, guys, get a haircut. If you smoke, stop smoking. If you drink, stop drinking. If you're not tithing, start tithing. Amen. Be obedient. Remember, your righteousness is not yours. It's God's. Amen. He'll give it to you. And if you really want your prayers answered, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man of Elithmud. Are you going to strive to be righteous? Amen. <laughs> Mr. Craig Clark, give Craig a hand. Thank you, preacher. Uh, I want to say a few things. First off, I want to I want to say about the light. Uh, Tony didn't turn his light off the other day in his office, so then. I didn't get called on right here. I didn't get called on for the song. So it says, I, I pick 140, uh, 449, the light of the world is Jesus, okay? Now, you were talking about Jesus being the light, the darkness, and there's only, just, just to make something clear right now before I get started, there's only one God, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And whoever cannot confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is God stay away from them. You leave them alone. In this world, there's a lot of people that are fooling a lot of people. And I'm going to tell you something that you people here have spent probably 20 to 30 billion dollars on a telescope that's the James Webb telescope that's out there. He's talking about science. Led me into this. And they have looked further than they've ever looked before in all of mankind. And you know what they found? How many people know about the Big Bang Theory? How many people were taught about the Big Bang Theory in school? Okay, there's more than a thousand scientists now that are head scientists that are baffled. And you want to know why? Because at the very beginning of the origin of where they thought there was the beginning of the time, they found billions of more stars and galaxies. So it blows away the Big Bang Theory, because if it was the Big Bang Theory, there'd be nothing left over here, and everything is flying out into space. That's what they say that we're doing right now. So that's not my message. <laughs> uh, you know what my message is? Uh, I had two names to my message. It's called... Uh, there's an old movie called Wing and a Prayer, okay? When you go off, like I, I go fishing sometimes. I don't get to go as much as I used to, but I go by myself. I go six, eight miles, ten miles out in the Gulf and by myself. And when you're out there, you're praying all the time. And you've, if you've ever sank in the Gulf of Mexico before, you pray all the time because you don't know when it's coming again. You're praying. And so my message name, it was going to be Wing and a Prayer, but I, I, I named it this. Is your prayer a blessing to God? And what I mean by that is I'm going to get into a couple of scriptures. And, and things that have happened in the past 
David had a heart after God. David had a heart after God. And what did he do? He called all the people together and he prayed. And who did he pray for? He prayed for Solomon. And what did he pray for Solomon to have? A perfect heart. A perfect heart, okay? That's in Chronicles. But more important than that, that was just an example. When you don't pray, like happened to Joshua, when he went out to AI, they got their rear ends whipped to him. And they're just coincidence now, AI is coming for you, okay? AI is coming for you. And it's going to happen. And the thing of it is, is the way you beat everything there is in the world is prayer. And the reason why that is, is Jesus said so. In John 17, 15, he said, I pray that thou should not take them out of the world, but thou should take and keep the evil from them. I always go back to God and I tell him, I say, you pray for me. You keep the evil from me. I may be evil. I may have done some evil things in my life, which every one of you have done evil things. And evil things inside of God now is it a blessing to God. You know how you get a blessing to God? You get back to where David was. When David was blessing God, he, he made all the people bow down. But he didn't have to make them at that time. You know why? Because they did it with obedience. They all bowed down. And they all prayed for Solomon too. And look what Solomon became. The, the wisest man and everything. But yet, you know, people talk bad about Solomon. I hear preachers talk bad about him, but those preachers really were never standing in the way where Solomon was standing. And if you can't stand in another man's shoes, I don't think that you should be able to really go over there and say, hey, you know, I know what's really happening to that man, you know, or what that man went through or how he is. So then you got John 17, 20, neither pray for them that are, that these are alone, but for those also which believe on me through their word. That's all the people of all the time that always were coming to this point in time. I'm left here for a reason. And my words that I speak right now may fall on deaf ears, but I'm going to tell you right now, God gives me everything that I got all my life. And has never, I have never ever not said that God gave me something. He gave me this just today, opening this book. That's the light. And you read those words that are in this book right here. It's just a book. It's an old book. This is an old book. But you can't go to a textbook of any sort, any time, and find anything like this. That's wrote by man. Okay, because they, they're not. They're of the world. They're of the devil. They are of the devil our whole system is of the devil, okay? And I can prove it to you. They're stealing money from you, okay? And the love of money is the root of all evil. And the devil was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And he's been growing. And if you can't see that, if you don't know that, it's because you don't read your Bible at all. A lot of people don't read their Bible at all. They've confessed to be Christians. They don't know one word of the Bible. I feel sorry for him. I have great sorrow for this world. And I have a sorrow that's like a vexed spirit. I told the preacher this about three years ago, right out here on the side. Don't you have a vexed spirit? You're living in a place that's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. It's worse. And it says it in Ezekiel. And it tells you in Ezekiel that you won't even recognize and talk about your sister Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't finish. <laughs> All right, let's see. Number four. Edgar, you in, buddy? I've 
been up to. Uh, I'm reading out of, out of uh, Ephesians 4, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn there. Ephesians 4, my verse is going to be verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Um, I don't know if you've been paying attention, not just to uh, what's going on in the world, wars, um, especially with Israel and uh, the terrorists, but just in general, the feeling around in the community or just the people you work with, there's a shift in attitude, there's a shift in uh, emotion, there's a shift going around throughout society, and it's, uh, it's scary to those who don't know what's going on. But for us as believers, we know where we're at. We know what times we're living in. And uh, if you're reading your Bible, if you're staying close to God, you're as prepared as you can be. And I say, keep going, keep doing it. But in times like this, there's also opportunity for those who claim the name of Jesus only to promote themselves only to promote their church, only to promote the success of themselves, not really caring to promote Jesus. And uh, I've come from a church like that. I've lived through it. Um, and it's been around for a while, but now more than ever, they're, uh, they're, they're getting after it. And uh, the title of this message was Anchoring in the Faith of Jesus. In the verse uh, that we read, or that I read, be no more children tossed to and fro. In times like this, there's going to be a lot of doctrines that are going to come out of the world, come out of the Christian world that claim to be Christian, um, talking about how Jesus is not God, but he is the Savior. I don't know how that works. Um, as Craig said, if anybody tells you that, you stay away from them. You either stay away from them or you prove to them. Being friends, being caught in the middle, I wouldn't do it. Because sooner or later, you will join them in that doctrine. To and fro, and carried about every wind of doctrine. Your doctrine is important. Your doctrine needs to be solid. Your doctrine needs to be anchored in Jesus Christ. Amen. The definition of, of doctrine is a set of beliefs. right? So it's what you believe. If you don't know your doctrine, if you don't know what this book says, and you don't believe it, you don't have an anchor. What happens to ships when they don't have anchors? What happens to things that aren't tied down in a solid foundation? And the waves keep coming. The waves of the world. The waves of society. Next thing you know, you were 10 feet from the shore having a good old time. Now you're 3 miles, 4 miles, 10 miles, 50 miles, stranded in the wide open ocean, not knowing what's around you, what's going on. And you're caught up in the mess that you're in, and you have lost focus on Jesus. And they do this knowing what they're doing. It says, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. This means that they, they know exactly what they're doing. They're working for a certain kingdom, and it's not the kingdom of heaven. I'm telling you that right now. They want to pull you away from Jesus. They want to pull you away and to focus on yourself. No matter what's going on in your life, you need to anchor yourself in the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's people in here that are going through cancer, death, illness, lost a job, lost a wife, divorce, single, you know, with kids. It's tough. But no matter what's going on, your anchor needs to be in Jesus Christ. When I was in high school, I played football, and now the football season's coming, I can finally use it. Um, I had an O-line coach, and one play, I was just getting ran over by the same dude, bigger dude. He said, son, if you don't anchor yourself in this floor, the floor's not going to go anywhere. You're going to get run over and crushed every single time. And I think about that, especially during this message, because life has no mercy. The world has no mercy. It will run you over until you anchor yourself and what you believe in. 
in the belief of Jesus Christ that he died for our sins. And if you don't anchor yourself down, you're going to get run over every single time. In our junior church and our Sunday school, I have made it my personal mission to teach my boys what it means to be saved and how to get to heaven. I teach it to them every single Sunday. Because I feel like little Larry, by the time he's 12, 15, he will have the strongest anchor in Jesus. But that's because, that, that's not because of me. It's because I've had a burden on my heart for these kids. Because I know, I know personally, growing up in a church that didn't preach Jesus. They preached prosperity. And it's funny how they teach prosperity when what was the first thing Satan offered Jesus in the, gar- in, in, uh, the garden? Prosperity. I'll give you everything you want. Sounds like a prosperity church to me. Yeah. These kids are our future. And if they're not anchored, if they're not anchored in Jesus, this church won't be here. The true churches won't be here. And this world will be completely lost until we get out of here. Hopefully soon. I think it will be. It's my personal mission to teach these kids, at least my boys and the girls when I do teach junior church, that Jesus is the only way and through his blood you will get to heaven. Nothing else. Nothing, nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Jesus plus nothing, as you say, preacher. Last but definitely not least, give Mr. Junior Dixon a hand. I just want to thank you, preacher, for the opportunity. It's been a while since I've been up here. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23. It says, but these things commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. I have a question for you guys. What does it mean, it may be well with you? It does not mean that everything, we, everything will be easy in this world. There will be times that we are going through heartaches, uh, losing a family member, uh, losing a job, losing whatever it may be. But it will be well with you. It does not mean that we won't have struggles. I struggle every day getting up to go to work. And believe me, it's a struggle. Uh, whatever struggles we do, we have, we just got to remember that it will be well with us at the end. And it also means that we won't have heartaches along the way, but it does mean that it will be well with you. In other words, it may be well with you is talking about the future more than the present. God did not say when, when it would be well with them, but he did promise it would be well with us at, at some point, but not at the time we want it. A lot of people these days want everything handed to them. <laughs> A lot of people these days want things that they didn't work for. Uh, but we got to remember that we have to, we have to do it ourselves, but with God on our side. <laughs> we are people that want everything, like I said, right now. But we have to pray about it. We have to... Uh, see if that's the right thing that God wants us to have or talk to, your, talk to our preacher and see if this is something that God wants us and if our preacher wants us to do. Uh, like I said, it's his timing, not ours. We must remember that God is an on, that God is an on-time God. Like, like I said, we have to pray about it and stuff and talk to God and see if he wants us to build this Sunday school class, if he wants us to build this bus route, if he wants us to 
uh, help Miss Liz in the nursery or, or whatever it may be. Amen. We must follow God's rule for it to be well with us. Number one, the promise to, uh, to be well with you is only for those who are walking and doing God's uh, will. Walking is a motion. You have to keep on moving. You can't just stay in one spot and say, oh, well, I'm going to have someone do this, but yet you're not willing to put the effort in to train them and stuff like that, you know? Uh, you cannot say it is well with you if you did not come to church constantly and faithfully. How many of you guys remember Brother Walls? I love that man. He, he's in heaven now. But he, every morning he comes into the church and he's all, press on. I'm going to all the gates. I remember when he came, I thought he was crazy a little bit, but get to, get, got to know him and stuff. And all, all I can remember, remember is press on. So we have to press on to keep doing God's will. If you are a seat warmer, you cannot say it is well with you. Some of us just want to sit there and not do anything. Like preacher preaches all the time, get busy for God. But some people just want to sit there on the seat and not do anything. Some people get mad about preacher preaching the truth or whatever. Like today we have a person that I talked to this morning, and they say, oh, well, what happened to so-and-so? They're like, well, Pastor Tony preached against homosexuality and stuff, and, well, I'm not coming back. I was like, well, the truth hurts, right? <laughs> you have to be obedient. The verse says that we should walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you. What are we walking in? We are supposed to be walking in God's commandments. Amen. We as people cannot expect everything to turn excellent if we are not obeying God's commandments. God's commandments are to help us in the things we call life. His commandments are a recipe to protect us from the sin to grievous ways. Amen. Number three, we must walk in all the ways. We, we cannot continue to pick and choose. Come on. Which commandments are, which commandments to follow it will not turn out the way we would want it to. All of God's commandments are necessary for us for it to be well with us. Amen. Number four, we must continue to walk forward and not backwards. Yeah. Press on. Yeah. In order for it to be well with us, God's direction is always forward and not back. Amen. Right. Obeying the word of God will keep pushing, keep pushing us forward in the faith. To walk backwards is like slapping God in the face. And we don't want to slap God in the face. Because remember, he's, he's God. He could do whatever he wants to do with us. He could, he could take us like that. Some people think they have their whole life ahead of them, but yet you just do one, one dumb thing and while well, God doesn't like it, he'll just take you like that. So today I finish off saying, it is your choice whether, whether all turns out well for you by whether or not you choose to walk forward and in God's commandments. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You can go ahead and take care of that. Brother Walls. <laughs> Who remembers him? Amen. Uh, you know, I truly believe when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that he was an angel. If anybody was, it was him because uh, the Bible says you entertain angels unaware. There's been a few of them, I think. Um, it was a hot summer day. I was going down Joe Lewis Street over there off of Foster Road. Anybody know I-10? 
There's a bunch of houses over there, poor, poor than poor. And he was walking down the street with that funky little hat he had sometimes. And all the way, I was giving him a ride to the truck stop, all the way, all he was talking about was he was born with club feet. <laughs> yeah. And I prayed for my club feet. So I didn't know, is this guy going to come to church or not? And he, sure enough. And he was a blessing, wasn't he? Yeah. Man, there's a lot of people that's come through this church that I miss that aren't here anymore either. They either croaked or they left or whatever. Uh, so that's, what, that's what church is all about. I mean, you, you touch lives. Let me ask you a question. Are you touching anybody? Is your fingerprint on anybody's life? Are you counseling anybody? Are you praying for anybody? Are you asking anybody over for dinner at your house? Are you helping anybody? Is your fingerprint on somebody's life? If not, you're just sitting there like you preach and doing nothing. What good are you? We need to take you back and you know, ushers need to just get rid of you somehow. <laughs> just kidding. Get busy for God, man. And when I say get busy... Love somebody. Find somebody that needs some love, man. Find somebody that needs help. There's plenty of people around here. The Lord's Supper is very important. It's one of the ordinances of the church. And you guys did a great job. Ray, that was the best. I've heard a lot of messages from you. That was the best. It really was. It really was. Uh, all you guys did good. Yet you gave truth. I know you don't have enough time, but hey, that's the way it is. Okay? <clears throat> Tell Miss Bell to Try to get her to get me to give you more time. Maybe I'll listen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. This is uh, when Jesus was zapped out of earth. And uh, he said, I want you to do two things. He's talking to the church, really. There's disciples there, but he was. this is a command to the church. I want you to do two things. Last thing Jesus said. He said, I want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to picket Washington with abortion signs. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, he didn't say I want you to read your Bible. Although he said it before. And the scripture says it. Or after, yeah. He didn't say, I, you need to go soul winning. Those are two very important things, aren't they? So what he told us to do has to be real important. And I can understand why this is one of them. This is one of two. Baptize. We baptize people today. People got baptized. The church, the local church. That was one of the things we said. You baptize converts. That means you're winning converts too. And you're showing pic. You're showing a picture. Whether you know whether I wear this wedding ring or not doesn't mean if you know it's not. I'm married whether I wear it or not. But to show people that I'm married, I wear it, and they they see that. All the ladies that want to ask me out at the grocery store and everything, they see that's how I wear it. That's why I wear it. Uh, so that's why you get baptized, to show people you belong to Jesus. And the second thing he said was to show what I did for you. Show my broken body. Show my blood that I spilt for you. Okay? And it makes sense because it's all about him, isn't it? Yeah, and he knows that. He's smarter than anybody, okay? He knows it's all about him. Not in an egotistical way. Of course not, because he, he can't sin. He's not a sinner. But he knows what's important. His death is important, what he did for us. Man, if I didn't have Jesus, I wouldn't have nothing. The Bible says and gives us directions. Jesus wrote the Bible, so he gives us directions here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, I want to read for you uh, first from uh, uh, verse 28, because he commands us before we do this to make sure your heart is clean. Make sure you ask, you forgive. If you've got a, some hidden sin that you haven't asked God to forgive, I hope you ask God to forgive you your sins every day. I don't know about you, but I sin every day. Amen? Uh, so, the Bible says, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Examine yourself. Examine your heart. Is there any sin I need to get rid of and ask God to forgive me? 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're making light of this. You're making light of the Lord's body, okay, by not asking, not cleansing your heart and taking of the, uh, the cup and the bread, okay, and you're just making mockery of it because you don't, it, this is all about getting your heart clean and remembering what he's done for us. You don't, you don't want to go to God with, un, you know, with sins that you haven't asked forgiveness of. So what we're going to, oh, well, let me keep reading. For this cause, verse 30, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That's, that's a dirt nap, okay? That's death. Many, I, Jesus is saying, I take many out, I take them to heaven, believers, because they don't take this serious. This is a very serious thing. I didn't write it, God did. So I suggest you take it very seriously. This is a personal thing. It's a personal thing. It's not between you and your wife or anybody else. It's you. You need to focus on your heart and you need to thank God for what he did for you. If you were the only one ever to be born, he would have died for you. He left the 99 went after you. The 99 went after you. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So, we have a piano player. We'll take about three minutes. And if you want to come to the altar and pray, you can. Or you can pray right at your seat as the music plays. Mm -hmm. 